Yes. All right. You see on the uh, screen there that we'll be in Romans chapter 8, but it'll be a little while before we get there. If you want to go ahead and get turned ahead to Romans chapter 8, and uh, we'll be there when we get there. We're going to be looking at struggling under a load of guilt this morning. Let's use a couple of verses to start off. I've got them on the screen here for you. I just realized that I put First Philippians. I was wondering where the one went when I, it, it disappeared off of Peter when, uh, when I was doing that. It ended up there on Philippians. There is no First Philippians. It's just Philippians. 4-4. Four, four. Yet the verse remains the same. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Notice that it does not say rejoice conditionally. It says rejoice always. And then from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, we've been in 1 Peter for a while, so I wanted to, uh, to use this one verse out of there. He says, as free, we have freedom in Christ, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your, uh, your time of, of looking into your word this morning, we pray, God, you'll speak into our hearts the way that you see fit, Lord reassure us god that you're not holding records against us and and keeping tally marks lord but that does not uh does not negate our uh our responsibility lord to live rightly before you uh father help us to understand the balance in jesus name amen, amen. all right so uh so like i said we've been in first peter for a few weeks now we've been looking at peter's call for the scattered believers to live holy, righteous lives in order that they could stand blameless in the eyes of accusers and possibly reach others in the, uh, in the new areas that they had fled for Christ. All right? And Peter is making the case that their, their behavior, their Christian conduct is crucial for that. Um, and now, of course, we have applied the wisdom of uh of those passages to our own lives as well as as refugees living in a foreign land waiting to go home one day and we sang about heaven this morning where we're headed we and uh you know we we hope that we might represent the lord well in this land that we live all right that we might protect our testimony and uh and, and, and amongst unbelievers do good works that glorify the lord right that we, like, like they so long before, might reach the loss that some may come to faith in Christ. That is our goal. That's the, the, way, the reason we want to live the way that we're supposed to live. All right? This morning I'd like to take a, a little break, sort of, from, from that First Peter line of study uh, this morning. For something that I see as equally important as our good conduct before the world. All right, you see, there, there, there's two common reactions that we might feel and which might multiply when we spend extended time uh, considering our needs to walk in the Spirit, walk in the light, not fulfill the lust of the flesh, let our conversation be holy over and over and over. And one reaction is healthy, and the other can be quite the opposite, all right? Now, what we would hope for, we would hope for when we read those things, is increased motivation, a revival of fortitude to do what we ought to do. And that's often the case. A lot of times, that's the way it works out. That's what we would hope to work out. But what can be just as likely as we hear terms such as holy, righteous, sinless, mature, what can happen is an immense sense of guilt. When we, and, and I, I do say when, not if, when we fall short of those goals, because we will. My friends, Jesus did not save us and set an example that he knew we could not match so that we would live defeated, guilt-ridden, unjoyful lives. He did not do that. I feel safe in saying that everyone here has felt the sting of guilt at some point. If you know Christ as your Savior, you have felt that guilty feeling, knowing that we have let our Savior down. 
that we did not match what he expected us to do. How much you individually struggle with it, now that's going to depend on many factors. And the, and the trigger is not necessarily the severity of your sin. It could be, but not always. But guilt, fueled by Satan, can be one of the most distracting, joy-killing things that we have to deal with as Christians. It really can. Now the thing is this. We do not have to live in guilt. We don't have to stay there. We will experience it, but we do not have to give it a foothold in our spirit. I hope with this message to give some encouragement uh, in how to avoid the kind of guilt that becomes detrimental to our walk with Christ. Somebody say, wait a minute. I didn't hear anybody. Somebody said, wait a minute. Did he just say the kind of guilt that is detrimental? Yes, I did. Now, I want to hit this point early. There is a form of guilt before God that hits us when we first realize that we stand guilty of sins that cause us to fall short of the glory of God. That is a, when we realize that, it, it should bring a guilty feeling. In, in that lost condition, if there was no guilt... There could not be salvation. If there's, if there's no realizing I'm under the penalty of sin, then, then there's, no, there's nothing to get saved from. There is, but you don't realize it. Now, I know I'm using the same word over and over and over, but there's no better way to explain it than this, than to say the feeling of guilt comes from and confirms you are guilty. That's what it tells us. You're guilty. By the way, that comes from God. When we call it, when it comes from Him, we call it conviction. Conviction. And also, in, in that kind of case, guilt, guilt confirms that we need the problem of unforgiven sin solved, which leads hopefully to faith in Jesus Christ, who is the only answer for sin. Now, I've heard a, I've heard a lot of sermons about guilt over sin through the years. And most of them I've heard tend to come from what I see as almost the wrong angle. Not an invalid angle, but maybe not the most prevalent when it, when it comes to addressing the biggest problem of guilt. Because most seem to, uh, to address excessive guilt that a person carries over things they did before they were ever saved. Guilt over what they were and the life that they were. And I'm not saying that's irrelevant. You know, many people struggle with that. But they, at least in, in, in my world, have been few that I've come across that are actually having that. You know, you most, seem, most people seem to understand what I'm saying, that that was another life. That was another creature. Christ has forgiven those things. Mark's not guilty, and that's done. And most people have a firm grasp of that. Now, that being said, I've never known a saved ex axe murderer or anything like that most of the people that i've known have been pretty benign paths just to be honest but but i would say to them all no matter what jesus is not fretting about your past he's not worried about that so you don't have to either the more common issue as i see it is not people who still feel to feel guilty about what they did years before they were saved it's people who feel guilty about what they did yesterday. Where I fell a little while ago. The, the, the biggest one is when it's the same sin over and over and over. How in the world am I falling into this again? Or, or maybe I've made a bad decision and now I'm kind of stuck in it until I can make things right. You know, like a, like a sin you can't get out of right now. Maybe it's just a, a pile of little failures for some people. I'll give you another one. Comparisons can cause guilt. Comparison to other, you know, we're always comparing ourselves to other people, aren't we? Whether we really want to or not. And when we see someone doing better, like they study harder or they pray more or their church is bigger, or then we can feel guilty because we aren't trying as hard as they are. You know, usually guilt is earned, too. I mean, it's usually got some validity to it, and it would 
it would be strange to feel guilty over something that we have no fault in. Which brings me to the next thing that guilt is good for. And that is that guilt shows us what we need to improve. Guilt over sin reminds us that sin is bad. It drives us to do better in the future. Guilt over complacency motivates us to be more active. It, it works because guilt is not a pleasant feeling. Who enjoys guilt? Nobody. I don't want to feel this guilt, therefore I want to fix what made me feel guilty. That's a good thing. That is to conviction. Conviction. That is our emotional response to the Holy Spirit's correction. But here's the thing. It only takes a little bit. It's only healthy in small doses. Amelia, where'd you go? I need you. Amelia always wants to be in my illustrations. Come be in my, in my illustration this morning. Right over here. I have in this tub some ordinary mashed potatoes that I made this morning and I was going to ask Amelia to try my sample my mashed potatoes what do you think about them it's pretty bland. a little bland hold on I think I got something I can fix that with a little, a little salt probably Give it a try now. Better? better? All right. So if it was better when I put a little salt, how would you like to try it now? <laughs> you don't have to eat that. You know it's no good. Too much. No, don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Too much of something that is good can turn bad almost everything is that is good when applied correctly turns harmful when it is taken to extremes um let me tell you this too satan knows how debilitating excess guilt is he knows what it does to us so anytime that he gets a chance what does he do pours it on pours it on think about back in uh, let's, uh in think about what what happens then when when guilt starts to to magnify think back to the the garden of eden when adam and eve sinned they were ashamed which is a form of guilt and what did they do they hid from god a little guilt will turn us to god a lot of guilt will tempt us to hide from him and the devil pouring it on i know he's I know he's not going to strike me, but I still don't want to be in God's presence when, when the guilt is strong because I can't bear the thought that I let him down so badly. You know, guilt, guilt has caused some Christians to just quit, to just, just stop. You know, when that sense of failure has come over and over and over and you repent honestly with, you repent honestly with no confidence that you'll be able to overcome the next time the temptation comes, some people just throw their hands up and walk away. Obviously, I'm no good at this. Obviously, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never get it right. And Satan is pouring it on. And they walk away. Excessive guilt has caused many to doubt their very salvation. You know that? So they, they walk away not even believing that they were saved. It's caused some to attempt to get saved over and over and over again, never believing that they, that they got it right. Or if they did, they wouldn't be the way they are. Excessive guilt will cause a person to focus solely on what they are guilty about to the neglect of the rest of their spiritual welfare. It becomes an issue where they think, if I could just get victory here if i if it was just for this if i wasn't weak in this one area everything would be fine but let me tell you if you get that one area under control and you should try properly something else will come to light that you need to work on it's there, it's always there it's something and that something else has been there all along but you couldn't see it because you're so hung up 
on the one thing because of guilt. All right, so I've beaten that horse long enough. Let, let's fix it. What are we going to do about it? How do we keep from falling into the pit of guilt? It requires a shift of focus on our part. There, there are some things that we have to keep in the forefront of our minds, and that is a challenge because guilt will fight to get there. Satan will strive to draw your attention to the sin and away from facts. All right. Number one, we need to remember what Christ did for us. Let me show you uh, this verse from Colossians chapter 2, 13 and 14, which says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and I love this, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All. When it says all, it means all. You can look that word up. It's an inclusive word. Past and future. And if you think about it, every sin besides the people who had already lived when Jesus died was a future sin. So it's not an amazing thing that, that Christ forgave future sins. None of them had happened yet. All right? Well, here's the thing. The impression is that sometimes that, that Jesus is holding forgiveness until the individual asks for it, all right? But that's not exactly correct. You see, Jesus forgave them all, all the sins of the world, and it's up to us to accept that forgiveness. Same concept as if, if you forgive somebody that wronged you, it's up to them whether they ever accept it or not. You gave the forgiveness, all right? So, so all your sins are forgiven when you've accepted Christ as your Savior, even the ones you have not committed yet. Even the ones you hate, but keep on committing. And here's the part we need to remember. Because we might mess up so bad that we even shock ourselves sometimes. I can't believe that I did that. Remember this, we serve an all-knowing Savior. When He took all the sins of the world on Himself, He knew everything we would ever do. Every abject failure, every little bitty thing, and he forgave us anyway. He said, I forgive anyway. And this is what the Bible says about those sins. Let me show you this. Psalms 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And Isaiah 43, 25, even I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my name, for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. I love that. Now I know there's there's some kind of correlation, there's a connection between the fact that, that God does know about our sins, and isn't like God's just ignoring everything that we do. He knows our sins and he brings chastisement and correction. There's a connection between that and those verses that we just read. But the essence is this. God is not holding our sins against us if, he is, if we've accepted Him as our Savior. He's forgiven them and, and they're, they're gone. And he's, you know, remember 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, you know, where Paul's telling us how to love by describing the character of who God is? Remember this one, 1 Corinthians 13, 5? doth not behave, speaking of love, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no, which means keep no account of evil. God's not keeping an account, not keeping a record of what we do so he can use it against us later. If God, who is absolutely holy, is not holding our sins, no matter how many against us, then why should we? Why should we? Next thing, let me show you this. We'll start with this verse from James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let me tell you this. When, when guilt is pouring on, it's a temptation to sin. It is, like any other. Hiding from God is a sin. Walking away from the faith is a sin. Any, any reaction other than repentance is failure. 
And when we feel guilty, then, you know, when we do that, we feel more guilty because then we fail to repent. And, you know, that snowball keeps growing. But just like any other temptation, there is always a way to escape. There is always a way to resist the devil, like we just read. And uh, the devil is an accuser and a liar, right? That's his nature. If, if we allow ourselves to fall into the guilt trap, we're agreeing with what he's saying. He's leading. If we go with him, we're saying, okay, you're right. If we, if we allow ourselves to fall into that. Whatever he says you are is the opposite of the way Christ sees you. Just understand that. He says you're a failure and useless to God. Don't agree with that. Here's what we need to do. We need to fight the devil the same way Jesus did in the wilderness. What did he do? He quoted scripture, the word, right back to him. Learn Bible passages that declare the way Jesus sees you. Right? The ones that we just looked at up there a minute ago were great. Romans 8. Did you go to Romans 8 earlier? Let's, let's, I just want to show you some examples of some great guilt-destroying verses of Scripture. We can start right there with chapter 1, I mean, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation to them that are in the Christ, who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All right, well, let's check out verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, and if you're saved, He's in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of this. All right. So the, the Spirit of Christ lives in us. We're, we're not our own. Let's, let's go down to verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Let's do one more, verse 33. And the whole chapter is great for this. I'm picking out some of this. Look at verse 33 says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. God said we're justified. Nobody else gets to lay things to our charge, not even ourselves. The New Testament is just full of verses proclaiming that we are, we are righteous. Not because we earned it, not because we did a great thing, but because Jesus placed his righteousness on us when we accepted him as our Savior. We'll show you uh, Romans chapter 3, 22 is plain. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. It's not that we were righteous on our own, it's that he gave us his righteousness. And there is a bonus to using scriptures to fight against the guilt of sin. Get this. The more we put that into practice, the more we will find that the very same action will strengthen us against the sins that made us guilty in the first place. So it is working both ways, and that is good. That is very good. Because even though we should not be weighed down by the guilt of sin, we should not sin in the first place. All right. I'm going to ask our musicians to go ahead and start headed to the front. I wanted to keep this short this morning because it was very important. I didn't want to lose anybody. All right. Let's do this while they're coming up. Look back to our verse from 1 Peter one more time. He said, as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. The word is clear. We have liberty, but we should not sin. All right? But if we do, I'll leave you with one more verse. 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. All we got to do is just confess it. Just admit to it and move on, and it's as gone as the far as the east is from the west. All right? Let's stand together this morning.